that you have changed over to. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, so this webinar series on critical transitions and complex systems is a uh, series organized by uh, jointly by IIT Madras and Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And we aim to bring together uh, researchers from various, working on various topics, ranging from climate science to physics to fluid mechanics to uh, epidemiology, from all kinds of fields, biological systems who work on uh, complex system research, in particular studying critical transitions and complex systems. First, a uh, few housekeeping items. Uh, please mute your microphones during the talk. And uh, uh, the second instruction is, uh, please use the, there's a Q and A box, type your questions in, and the speaker will answer the questions at the end of the, uh, uh, at the end of the lecture. And uh, about Marvin, I think it needs no introduction, but uh, just for the formality, uh, he's the deputy chair of the complex systems department at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research at Potsdam, Germany. His research focuses on analyzing complex systems with a special interest in further development and use of methods such as recurrence plot and complex networks for nonlinear data analysis. He applies his techniques to various uh, interdisciplinary areas with particular focus on earth science and paleoclimatology. And uh, today he's going to talk about reference quantification. This is his favorite topic. So with no further delay, let's welcome uh, warmly uh, Dr. Norbert Marr. All yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and thank you very much for the invitation. It is really an honor to yeah, be part of this um, webinar series where these really um, big names have already presented their work and their ideas. So I would like to um, tell you a bit about recurrence analysis, recurrence plots and recurrence quantification analysis. I think this is um, a topic many might um, link it with my name. And I have, so I have um, selected three topics. So I first would like to just introduce this idea of recurrence, recurrence plot and also the base, which is necessary for it, which is the base space. Then I will tell you a bit about recurrence quantification analysis and then how we can extend these to have um, bivariate analysis, coupling analysis, synchronization tests. Um, this uh, webinar is not long enough to explain all these interesting aspects this method has. But at the end, I will show you a bit in the, yeah, some novel directions the method could go in the future and also some further aspects that I cannot cover here in this webinar. Yeah, why recurrence? Um, recurrence is some interesting dynamical feature that it's ubiquitous in real life and you can see it actually everywhere in engineering in our um, human body or in any other organism, also in ecology, yeah, we have these predator prey cycles, also in climate, we have recurring phenomena. And we can find recurrence at different domains. So in general, we are looking at time, but we could also uh, find recurrences in space or in combinations of space, space and time. And also many different scales. It could be in seconds, days, years, to millions of years when we talk about the climate, for example. Or also in space, yeah, from very small, from micrometers to meters to kilometers, and even to astronomical um, lengths, like light years. And so this is in general a very fundamental characteristic of many dynamical systems, and it's well known for a long time. So even our ancestors have already studied the current phenomena, for example, for agricultural use of astronomical purposes and uh, some have used these uh, very big machines to study recurrences. Also in the ancient time, um, we had some people working with recurrent phenomena, for example, Anaxagoras more than 2000 years ago for studying chaotic circular movements in the term for term the pericoresis. And um, you might know much better, of course, um, Henri Poincaré, a mathematician, 
to try to solve the CBID problem. And one of his findings was a so-called recurrence theory, which is one of these basic mathematical um, foundations in dynamical systems theory, which simply states that um, you just need to wait long enough, then any dynamical system will come back to any previous state as close as we would like to have it. So this is a very fundamental problem or theorem and um, more or less a foundation of the recurrence analysis, how we do it. And there are many um, tools to study recurring behavior, for example, power spectrum and wavelet analysis, two, two tools which are quite um, well known, I think. Um, actually, these are more limited to studying cycles in data. I will show you that with recurrence plots, you can study many more aspects. And that actually the idea behind is much simpler than for power spectrum or wavelet analysis. And to come now to the recurrence plot, we, <clears throat> which was uh, first introduced in 1987 by Ekman and co authors, with a very small uh, publication on neurophysics letters. And since then, you can see we have a growing number of applications of recurrence plots. And this is this uh, orange uh, um, area here. And we have an increasing number. And if we also look for papers which are actually not using recurrence plots for their analysis, but just mentioning or referring to it in the paper, this is uh, even a large, much uh, larger number, which I think it's a good indication that this method becomes more popular even for scientists who are not using it. And th that this method is also something which is already well accepted in the community. And of course, an increasing number of, public, uh, of um, software is also important to make it more popular and to support the application of this method. So you can see here, we have an, actually in all um, major um, analysis software um, pipe packages or applications that can be used for studying recurrences or recurrence plots. If you're interested, you can also look at this website. There's an up-to-date list of software. So what is the foundation of this recurrence? What we are looking at? It's actually um, the phase space. We need the phase space and the phase space trajectory. We are talking about recurrences and phase space. And the phase space is a representation of the dynamics of a physical system. Usually the state variables represent the dimension of the phase space. And the phase space idea is used for many different um, investigations in dynamical system theory, for example, to estimate dimensions or the Kunov exponents. And the main problem is if we have only one observation, we have one time series measured, we don't have a phase space. We need to reconstruct it. And there are different ideas how to do it, yeah, for example, time delay embedding or some other more advanced methods. And I would like to point here to the CTCS lecture by Michael Small, who has already shown how we can reconstruct the phase space from time series. I will not um, put here too much time in this direction. Just to have a remark here, phase space reconstruction is actually not part of the recurrence plot method. Yeah, this is some kind of a pre-processing step. The current plot itself just looks at the phase space, the trajectory, where this phase space trajectory comes from is actually a completely different question. Because now I often see that um, people are using the current plots and then say our phase space reconstruction is a necessary um, step of, of uh, the current analysis, but it's actually not true. It's just a pre-processing step. We can also apply um, the current plots on any other uh, recurrent, um, any other phase space the presentation that's not just coming from the construction. What is now um, a recurrence plot in special? And let us consider a short part of a phase space trajectory here on the left and just one state, say state at time point five. Um, then we have a recurrence matrix, which is a um, square matrix where each column belongs to time and also the rows are time. Now we have time point five here. This is indicated by this column. And now we look for all neighbors that fall into some kind of uh, neighborhood of this time point. Now, for example, this um, state at time point 14 falls in this, inside this neighborhood. And then we mark an entry one in the recurrence matrix. 
Then we go up one time step, time step six. Again, looking at the neighbors, the next neighbor or the, the, the close neighbor is number 15. We make a point here in the recurrence matrix. And this is something we proceed with all of these uh, states along this phase based trajectory. We look for all neighbors along the phase based trajectories and make these combinations of time points um, entry one and the recurrence matrix. And then we get something that looks maybe like this one or can also have other appearances, a more um, form of formal uh, or mathematical um, view. We simply look for similar states in phase space. And we have two states at time point i, time point j. We look at that they are similar. If they are similar, then we have an entry one. Now the question is what means similarity? We can simply use a matrix, for example, the spatial distance between these uh, states. Then we can write it down in this expression where we have here some kind of a distance. And we say that the distance is smaller than a certain threshold, which is this value epsilon here, then we have a value one. The matrix is actually binary. And usually when we have a, a matrix, then it's also a symmetric matrix. And the key point here is this distance, because this distance could also be um, adjusted depending on the research question. For example, if we have non-stationary data, then a standard metric might not work. Then we can also replace these by another kind of a recurrence definition, for example, order patterns. Or when we have event data, very discrete data or extreme data, then we can also not uh, use a standard metric like an Euclidean distance. Then we need another one. And one idea is here to use this aided distance matrix. And there is also another matrix which is suitable for spatial temporal recurrences called Webogram. If you're interested in this, we can also discuss later. I will not go into details here, but just to mention that we have this option here to, by changing the recurrence definition, we can also adjust the method to our certain needs in our uh, analysis and investigations. Yeah, we had also this. Uh, threshold here. But this, this is a free parameter that can be um, used to select what the uh, recurrence is. And there is actually not a general rule because the selection of this threshold depends on the research question, on the application. There might be some rules of thumb you might find in the literature, um, but for a um, very first um, idea or for the very first approach when you are a beginner and would like to work with recurrences, then simply use the quantile approach. You have the distance matrix and you look at the cumulative distribution and you look at this point where this um, cumulative distribution exceeds a certain level, for example, 10%. If you use then this um, value um, distance at this uh, uh, value, this is then the 10% quantile, then this corresponds to our Recurrence rate is ten percent, and this is a very good choice for um, a recurrence threshold. You will simply set the recurrence rate or the density of points in the recurrence plot, and then you have a very easy um, recurrence threshold. The recurrence plots um, look different for different dynamics, as you can see here. We have periodic, chaotic, and random. All of them show your characteristic patterns, and we could even look at um, more details, um, so-called topology. This even um, goes back to the very first uh, paper by Heckman et al., who defined homogeneous and uh, thrifty and periodic appearances. We could also have here these disrupted appearances. Already by just looking at the recurrence matrix or recurrence plot, we can um, infer some specific properties of the dynamics. <coughs> How we can do it, I can show you. A, a simple example coming from this uh, paleo climate um, topic we are working on. Um, so for a long time, there's a debate whether hominin evolution um, was forced by some climate changes. And as you can see here, we had some droughts in the past, and this could happen some, or this could uh, trigger some um, evolutionary steps in the human evolution. But at the same time, it's also known that there were some lakes, large lakes. So this is actually a bit uh, incompatible with these shorts. And therefore, there's a large debate and still a lot of working on in this, um, in this field. And we could ask whether we can somehow classify the regimes, climate regimes here. And I use here um, a lake 
Record, the Lake Sediment Record from so-called Chubahar, this is in Ethiopia. And on the right, you can see the time series based on this um, uh, drilling of the lake sediments. And by some interpretation, we know that this is more bad or more dry. I mean, we have more positive, it's wet and dry. And then we can calculate this recurrence plot. It looks like this one. What is already is striking here are these empty regions or empty bars, more or less uh, less um, occupied bars in the recurrence plot. And these reflect some kind of transitions. So we can also find here these blocks I have uh, indicated by these blue uh, squares. You can see um, these block-like structures which correspond to a specific behavior. And if we know what kind of structures in these um, small pieces of the recurrence with all these recurrence patterns mean, then we can also infer already some kind of a qualitative uh, dynamics in a qualitative way. Like it's more persistent or is it more irregular, more chaotic, and so on. But it would be better if we have real numbers to it. And these points meet to the recurrence quantification analysis. I already spilled it in Weber in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, we are asking whether we can somehow express these features that we can see in the recurrence plot by some numbers. And the first idea was to somehow find features like lines in the recurrence plot and use them to define some quantifiers, for example, diagonal lines. And as you can see here, there are many structures in the recurrence plot that can be used. In the following, I will only um, look here at the diagonal lines. Um, but before I come to this, just to mention, um, we can also simply calculate the density of points in the recurrence matrix, which corresponds to the correlation sum. It's already uh, going back to the early 80s, uh, by, defined by Krasberger. This is the probability that the system will return. So the recurrence uh, rate or recurrence density is one of the easiest, simplest measures here and also a very important one. But uh, more interesting are, of course, these diagonal lines because they have a specific meaning. When you have a phase-based trajectory and you have another part of the phase-based trajectory that, that comes close to this first part. And it runs for some time um, very um, in, in parallel to it like in a tube, and then it is leaving this um, vicinity of our first trajectory. It, um, we have some time that they are running in parallel, and this is exactly the length of such a diagonal line. So always, um, or each uh, diagonal line in a recurrence plot means our phase-based trajectory comes back to a former state and runs for some time in parallel. And so, Faster it will diverge, like when we have a chaotic dynamics, also these lines become shorter. If we have longer lines, it means we have them less chaotic behavior. So these uh, line lengths are somehow related with the divergence of the trajectories and therefore the scales. And if we also look here uh, at different um, uh, realizations or what you have already shown, these different uh, versions or different um, dynamics, um, we have the uh, we have recurrence plots which have diagonal lines, and we have recurrence plots where we have only single points. And these single points appear only for stochastic systems. Diagonal lines usually appear when we have deterministic dynamics. So this was also one main finding in the, the main findings in the beginning of the nineties. And the idea was then to simply use a fraction of the points that form these diagonal lines, so that we have a measure that can say uh, we have diagonal lines in the recurrence plot or not. And this is the first measure that also Spilett and Weber were introducing in 1992. We simply counted the lines or the points in the recurrence plot that form lines, or we can simply count the distribution of um, diagonal lines and have then a histogram. And from this, we can calculate the fraction of points that form diagonal lines. And this is so-called determinism or percentage determinism, because the larger it is, or when this is a one, then we have only diagonal lines. If it is zero, then we have only single points. And this is a nice way to somehow qualitatively interpret the dynamics, but with a quantifier. But we should be uh, careful. This is not a mathematical definition of determinism. Yet it's more a heuristic measure, which can give us an um, indication that our system might be deterministic or not. Or we could also interpret it in the term of predictability, because uh, the more deterministic a system is, the more predictable it should be. 
There are also other structures that we have already seen. Yeah, we have also a vertical structure, so we could use the empty distances between uh, vertical or the empty vertical distance between uh, structures and recurrence plot. And all of these uh, have some specific meaning. And there are also some ideas how to quantify them. There are many measures if you're interested, and there's a rich literature which describes these measures. And more recently, this method was also extended to, to the network or to use networks to quantify recurrences, um, where we simply identify the time points as nodes of a network, and all recurrences are identified as links. And then we have a so-called recurrence network, and this offers us to use all these complex networks measures or statistics to explain or describe the topological properties of our phase-based trajectory. It's also a very powerful uh, approach. And I, yeah, I think we might also have a webinar here on this topic maybe in the future, because this is a very powerful technique. To study now transitions with these uh, current quantifiers, we can approach different um, or we can use different approaches. For example, we can cover our recurrence plot by a moving window. Then we have these sub-recurrence plots. And in these sub-recurrence plots, we calculate these recurrence measures. We could also simply um, window our time series. For these uh, windows, we calculate small recurrence plots and calculate the uh, um, recurrence measures. It's um, a similar way to do it. So this means we, have, we need some kind of uh, windowing technique, get our recurrence measure, for example, this determinism, determinism measure that I have shown you, and have a temporal evolution of it. Now we might ask whether this measure shows us some transitions or uh, some non-stationarity. And this brings me to a very important point here, because this variation that we see needs to be tested, whether this is really significant. And there are different ideas how to do it. I can show you here one approach, a so-called bootstrapping of line structures. So we have these moving um, recurrence plots, the, the, these windows of, um, over the recurrence plot, which gives us these small recurrence plots. And for all of these small recurrence plots, we get distributions of the line lengths. And now we merge all of them together and have some kind of a master distribution of line lengths. And then we draw with this bootstrap approach, a number of these line structures from this master distribution and calculate our recurrence measure, for example, this determinism measure. And by this, we have done an overall um, um, yeah, picture of the determinism measure. And this can be used to calculate or to um, construct a test distribution, empirical test distribution, and using them some quantiles of it, we can then say that our real um, determinism is exceeding these um, quantiles or not. If I apply this to the example shown before, then you see here this 95% uh, confidence interval is larger than the variability, which means we cannot say our um, determinism measure is uh, worrying in the way that we have some specific transitions here. Um, I have another example from paleoclimate, now not using uh, lake sediment data, but sediment from the marine, from the ocean seafloor, from the ocean uh, drilling program. And let us look here at the dust flux records. This is a proxy for aridity in Africa. Yeah? And time series looks like this. The higher it is, more arid it is. And now we simply apply a moving window. And within this moving window, we calculate our recurrence measures. Um, again, here this determinism measure, apply our um, statistical test. And we have done some kind of a threshold. We say now when we exceed this uh, quantile, then we have a significant transition. As I mentioned, large determinism values mean we have more predictable. When, we, when it's very low, then we have more stochastic behavior. This is, uh, these are more terms that the paleoclimatologists understand better than uh, um, physical terms. And if you compare now these significant increases of this determinism, so where we have more predictable phases, and we compare it with the uh, African lake occurrences, for example, then we see in most cases, we had these African lakes, we had more predictable 
climate variability. So obviously this um, local climate or regional climate in Africa was related with a more global um, specific pattern, more predictable pattern of the climate. Um, at the last application, I would like to show you here how we can use occurrence analysis to study or to study our complex um, coupling or synchronization between different systems. You had already seen the recurrence rate, which we calculated as the density of points over the entire recurrence plot. Now just let us look at the recurrence rate or the density of points along a diagonal. Now this is this orange bar you can see here. And we move this uh, diagonal apart from the main diagonal and measure the density along this diagonal. And this gives us a probability that the system will return to a former state after a certain lag. And this lag here is exactly the distance from the diagonal to the main diagonal. And this can now be used as a measure of, of, for comparing with other systems. Because if we have this other system which is synchronized, then we should have the same probability of recurrences. Yeah. Like here in this example, we have these two probability distributions and at a certain lag, we have then high values because these probabilities are high that the system returns at this specific lag. And to compare these two uh, probability curves, we can, for example, use the Pearson correlation coefficient. So this is the uh, first idea um, when this was introduced almost 20 years ago. And if we, uh, one um, point also to remark here is that we have to ignore this first part. If we would not ignore it, then we would have a very high synchronization index, even if the systems are not synchronized. Therefore, we should uh, only consider the remaining part after the first minimum of these um, probability distributions. We could also use other measures, not just Pearson correlation. We could also use the Spearman correlation coefficient. It might be better because the, the probability distribution of this um, recurrence measure is not a normal distribution. And other ideas could be, for example, Hellinger distance or an other matrix to compare these. And if we have another system which is not synchronized, as an example um, shown here on the bottom plot, we have two independent systems. The structure of these recurrence times is completely different. And the, this um, CPR index, which is the synchronization index, would then be very small. And this is a very simple measure that can be used to study um, synchronization between two systems. And as an example, coming back to the Martin Ocean drilling program, here I have used a so-called Sinogrid time series, which is a reference record for the past 67 million years. So it's a really very long time. It has a very high temporal resolution. You see here with 5,000 years. It sounds maybe a bit long, but for such very old time series, paleoclimate time series, is a very, very high temporal resolution. And this is based on um, Isotope measurements of so-called benthic foraminifers. These are single organisms living on the seafloor. They have some carbonate shells, and then the oxygen and carbon isotopes were measured, and the oxygen isotopes are related with the temperature. And therefore, we can use these oxygen isotopes to get a new time series or a very long time series of the temperature of the Earth, the global temperature of the Earth for the last 67 million years. And you can see here already that um, based on the um, yeah, amplitude of the temperature, we can identify warm house, hot house, or cold house, or even ice house regimes. So the climate was uh, really warm in the past. And now with our ongoing global, global warming now, we are going back to these uh, hot house states now. And the exceptional case here is that this new time series has, has such a high temporal resolution that we can also apply statistical methods and linear data analysis to it. And it is known that the climate is somehow forced by the orbital parameters of the Earth, right, which is uh, triggering or 
um, responsible for changing solar insulation at the Earth. One is the obliquity of the Earth axis with the axis tilt, which is changing this 41,000 years. And uh, you can see it at the bottom, so-called obliquity time series. Now we might ask whether we have a coupling between these two or whether they are somehow synchronized. When we calculate the correlation coefficient, it is very small, or it's even negative, and it's actually a non-significant correlation measure. But if we now apply our recurrence analysis, I can show you what we can find with this. Already in the recurrence plot, we see some structures that coincide quite well. And we have these line structures, but the distance between these line structures correspond to the return times. And this is something that we can get um, or can quantify with this recurrence rate spectrum. Here we calculate this tau recurrence rate probability distribution for a certain lag. And we see already just by eye that these two probability distributions for xenocrit and for the obliquity um, show the same time scales. And the correlation coefficient between these two is 0.64, which is exceeding the confidence level, which is uh, 2.7 uh, 2.2 of 0.27. Now with this, we could even look whether this um, correlation or this um, synchronization measure changes over time. This is what I have uh, tried here in the lower plot. <clears throat> yeah. We see some epochs where we have significant synchronization and others where we don't have significant con uh, synchronization. And what is striking here is when we have this synchronization, then we have these extreme regimes. Yeah? We have this hothouse phase, or we had this ice house phase, this very cold regime. So obviously this synchronization is somehow uh, responsible, or this is maybe an indication of a specific climate regime where this um, orbital forcing was triggering the climate. And as an outlook, just a few examples, in particular, when we work with paleoclimate data, we have a lot of uncertainties yeah, coming from dating uncertainties or from gaps in the data. And then we have actually not a scalar time series, but we have a time series of probability distributions. And then it's not so easy to say what is now a recurrence or not. Our standard recurrence definition now turns to a probability of recurrence. Therefore, we have instead of a binary recurrence matrix, we have a matrix of probabilities of recurrences. Or when we have extreme event data like precipitation, then we cannot apply a simple um, distance, a Euclidean distance measure. We need then a specific um, matrix for measuring similarity in uh, such extreme events data. One idea is the so called eta distance data, which can even be used then to define power spectrum from extreme events data using. The recurrence plots, or we can then even compare or correlate different kinds of time series like uh, extreme events data with continuous data. There are also novel recurrence quantifiers, just to mention here, one is using so called microstates, which means um, in the recurrence plot we have very small patterns that we measure there and calculate the distribution of it, and then we can calculate the entropy. And this seems to be a very um, good alternative for entropies or for the defining the complexity of the dynamics. Or we have seen now um, so-called recurrence like minority, which is measuring the scales in the recurrence plot, which refers also to the scales and uh, the time scales in the time series. Seems also to be a quite interesting alternative for defining time scales. Um, yeah, everyone is talking about machine learning, then yeah, no wonder that we also have machine learning and recurrence somehow um, combined. Um, I, I see here more or less a tendency coming from the machine learning community, just using recurrence plots as a tool to somehow make a time series or some uh, scalar time series to uh, images and then to apply, for example, image machine learning tools for classification. And instead of a summary here, I just would like to mention all the different aspects. I mean, these, these are not all, but many of these aspects that we can um, look at with recurrence plots. And we have seen um, transition analysis, time scale detection. I have mentioned that we can estimate uh, power spectrum 
from time series using recurrences. But there are also um, ideas for um, yeah, how we can find dynamical invariants with recurrence plots, or that we can, when we compare different time series, that we can apply or find um, the adjustment or transformations between the time axes. We can also find uh, specific macrostructures in time series, in particular when we have a very high sample data or of, of uh, oscillating data, then these fancy patterns can be used like a microscope to see very tiny structures or very tiny uh, variations in the frequency domain. And I mentioned also spatial recurrences. This is also a very interesting field. And with this, I would like to thank you and I am happy to answer your questions. Oh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. And I think the number of questions, uh, I think, can you see the questions in the Q&A box? Yeah. Yeah, so you can answer them one after another, either in the order or any other order. Yeah. Yeah, what is so many questions? Yeah, more coming, yeah. Okay, the first question is, chaos is deterministic. Will the determinism be high for chaotic data? Yeah. I, so this determinism measure is measuring the fraction of points that lie on these diagonal lines. When we have a chaotic system, then we not only have diagonal lines, we often have also single points, and therefore the determinism might be not so high as for a periodic process, for example, that we only have diagonal lines. It is higher than zero, but it's not maybe one. But it can be one when we have a very smooth system, which is very highly sampled, like a Rosler oscillator. Yeah, so yeah, we have um, some aspects we have to uh, consider here. One is that we can have these uh, single points also for chaotic systems, but the other one is also the sampling of the system. And therefore, we need then some tests. I mean, to simply um, use recurrences, recurrence plots as a test for chaos, it's not enough. We need an additional step. It can be an indication, but it's not a um, sufficient test at the end. I hope this answers this question. <clears throat> So um, Christian Siegel is asking whether um, when we have a drift in the data, whether we have to remove the drift. Yeah. Um, this was uh, oxygen data in the ubiquity example. I think this was from this one here. In this example, I have not removed the trend. Um, we had published already this data in this uh, science paper where we also have applied recurrence analysis. And then we have indeed removed the trend because when we would not remove the trend, we would really see the long-term behavior, the, the long-term variation, which is also interesting. Yeah, this can be used to identify these different climate regimes as we see here, this warm house, hot house, and so on. But if we are really interested in these more fine scale variations, fine scale variability. We have to remove the long-term trend. And there are different ways to remove it. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I think I have used the vector loss filter to remove this trend here for this example. For the um, for synchronization analysis, I have not removed the trend there. It was working even without uh, um, trend removal. Um, can we differentiate chaotic and quasi-periodic states using recurrence quantifiers? Yeah, so quasi-periodic usually also has some long diagonal lines, continuous diagonal lines, and just the distance between these diagonal lines is changing. Maybe I can show you here an example. <clears throat> so the distance between these uh, diagonal lines in the periodic system corresponds to the period length. When we have quasi-periodic dynamics, then we have many different periods. 
but we still have these diagonal lines. I have not um, an example here, but we could maybe show you, or there are some uh, publications already about this quasi-periodic dynamics where you can really see how the current plots look for quasi-periodic systems. You can really distinguish them chaotic from quasi-periodic regimes. Yeah, you, you simply need to measure the distances between the vertical distances between the recurrent structures in the recurrent plot and simply by the statistics or distribution of these return times or recurrence times, you can find whether it's chaotic or quasi periodic. So, <clears throat> another question is on symbolic recurrent plots. What are the pros and cons in consideration different variations? Yeah, this depends simply on the research question. I have already mentioned here the um, yeah, one specific case of a symbolic recurrence plots, which is based on order patterns. Order patterns are what you can see here. Um, these are for order patterns of length three. We simply look at the local rank order in our time series and use the symbol to characterize them. And then we have a highly discretized new time series and we simply look whether we have recurrences of these symbols. This works quite well when we have, for example, non-stationary data or data with a long, with different trends and uh, removing the trend is not so easy. Um, I also have seen some works which have used these for um, studying or comparing stochastic systems with deterministic systems based on these order patterns because for um, stochastic dynamics or stochastic systems, there are some order patterns that are very unprobable, very unlikely. And you simply need to look then at the distribution of the order patterns, which could also be done then by the um, measure of recurrent plots. Does kite-like structures in uh, P always refer to intermittency state? And this is a very specific question. Um, I think it refers to what we can maybe see here, not so easily. <clears throat> So for example, in the lower left one, we have here these um, extended wide regions, uh, these blocks. And these are usually indications of um, states that are trapped, that are not changing over time or changing very slowly. Therefore, we have the subsequent states that fall within the same neighborhood and make an extension of the, vertical, of the recurrent structures in the recurrent plot. That would not always refer to intermittency as the question is here, but it can be an indication of intermittency. If we know that uh, we have a system where intermittency can appear, then we can even use these structures or the shape of these uh, blocks to distinguish different kinds of intermittency. But we could have these also just by some artifacts. For example, if we have a time series with gaps and we interpolate, then due to this interpolation, we can have very smooth or slow um, variation in the time series. And this could also cause these block structures. And this is, of course, um, has nothing to do with intermittency. It's just an interpolation artifact. We can have similar things also when we have a system which is maybe um, falls down to a certain value, um, which is not changing. and. This, this could also cause these block structures. And it really depends whether the system can have intermittency or not. So this is, when we have these block structures, it's really difficult to say whether it is then really an intermittency or not. We need to know, to know more than about the system. How would you quantify the variability in the time between each recurring event? I'm not sure if I understand, understand correctly. Does you mean then the recurrence times? So we can measure the vertical space between recurrence structures. This is an estimator for recurrence times. Uh, there are also some um, 
pitfalls and some some issues that should be more, uh, yeah, more critical considered when we do these but we can actually measure the vertical distance can calculate um, distribution of these vertical distances and can estimate or also can, can quantify this for example by entropy this is called recurrence time entropy or recurrence period density entropy there are different ways that can be used to this to do this um, then I have shown you the Uh, this quantifier here, the determinism, and the question is whether this L min that we see here, this minimum line length, is an arbitrary choice. And how related to this is to the average length of diagonal lines? I think this is a good question, and this I cannot answer. It might be good to, um, to study whether it depends on the average length, but in general, it should be at least two. If it is one, then we would not have any um, yeah, information. And then, then this measure would simply be two. So it, is a, it should be at least two. And this works for highly, or no, uh, this works for most systems, I would say. But if we have highly sampled systems where we have a very smooth or very um, or slow change of, the, uh, of our values, then we will have only long. Uh, diagonals and then it might be useful to extend this a bit. We had um, cases where we need larger values for this minimum line length. Um, it depends on the data, right? if, if, how the data is sampled and whether we need also, I mean, we could also apply this as a filter to filter out um, more high frequent changes, but which are still causing diagonal structures. What is the major utility of joint recurrence plots and cross recurrence plots? I have not shown you here, or did I? We can extend recurrence analysis to um, bivariate um, analysis. We had seen already how we can do it using this uh, recurrence rate spectrum, but we could also use um, so-called cross recurrence plot where we put two phase-based trajectories in the same phase space and measure the distance between these two. And you can see here the modification to a normal recurrence plot that we have now here instead of X, we have yeah, the second system in this. And the other um, idea is so-called joint recurrence plot, which has, or where we for each system have its own phase space. We calculate the recurrence plot for these two systems separately and we multiply them, which means we look at synchronous recurrences. When we look here at the cross recurrence plot, it means we are looking whether our systems or two systems visit the same region in phase space. And the temporal um, differences doesn't matter so much. These temporal differences might be seen then, for example, by the change here of this main diagonal, where um, <clears throat> So both systems are in the same region in the phase space, but at different times or slightly different times. For example, one could be a stretched version of the first system. But for the joint recurrent plot, we need exactly the same timing. And the phase space itself could be completely different. So the, the state variables or state values can be completely different. It could even be different dimensions of the phase spaces. But we are only looking for the same recurrence patterns. So this is the main um, difference. And therefore, both approaches are valid and are complementary to each other. And we, when we compare similar states, and different timing is allowed. But the other one is that the states can be completely different, but we are more looking at the same timing. And this is something which is also known as the generalized synchronization. Mm. If a box like structure is present with the height diagonal structure, can be called it laminar chaos. Um, yeah, maybe yeah, when, when, when we know that, uh, that we have a chaotic system, 
um, it could be then cures with some lamina states, I would say, or with some intermittency. So the question was now on the threshold selection. <clears throat> I had shown you the idea that we can use the quantiles. Um, okay. And we would like to um, estimate the threshold. We can use this quantile approach. This means um, actually our threshold is set by a pre-selected recurrence rate. Of course, this is arbitrary, but for a first glance, it is just good to have a five or 10% recurrence rate, which means a five or 10% of points in a recurrence matrix. And if we have more, say 50% of points, then I'm quite sure you will not see any interesting structures. If it is too small, then you also will not see so many structures. So we need some points in recurrence matrix. So, Advantage of this approach here is that we have a pre-selected recurrence rate, and we don't think about too much about the threshold. And we simply set the recurrence rate. We might require the recurrence rate to be 5% or 10%, could also be 1%. And then the threshold just comes automatically. But we can, of course, also use other approaches for um, the threshold selection. If you are interested, I could also show you here some further examples. But yeah, let us first uh, consider the other questions here. So I think the, um, the quantile approach is a very powerful approach to define the current threshold. Is there a recurrence measure that quantifies the amplitude modulation in the LCO? I'm not sure what LCO means. Maybe you have to write again and tell me what you mean. Next question regarding the computation of RQA measures. How does one decide on the minimal diagonal line length? That is, I think we had already answered. Um, have recurrence analysis techniques been applied to orbital to dynamics? Hmm. I'm not sure whether we had some applications. And I did, I, I played a bit with it, but have not published. So I have on um, um, my lectures some examples where I use these orbital parameters. But I think it's not published. And I also don't remember any analysis about this. But you can have a look. We have a library or a, a good bibliography about recurrence analysis. I, I might find that. Should the length of the time series considered be reduced if the recurrence plot looks very crowded? How can one choose the length in that sense? Yeah, there are different options. If we have a very long time series and would like to calculate the recurrence plot, um, we can do it, but it's not so easy to visualize it. When we just put it on the screen, of course, um, the screen has a specific dimension, maybe 2,000 points, pixels, and then you will have some downsampling. And you will not see any interesting features, maybe. You need them to zoom in. Or another alternative is to consider only a small fraction of the time series, say you have uh, some windows, then you can see it. Or another option would be to have some kind of a coarse grain. You first downsample the data, but then you use, of course, um, the small scale valuation. You have then only the large scale valuation. An alternative approach is to apply some kind of a um, decomposition of the time scales, for example, wavelet transforms. There were already some uh, works in this direction. And then you can start with the long time scales look with recurrence plots on these, and then you can identify interesting regions, and then you go down to time scales to smaller time scales and study the recurrence of the smaller time scales and in certain time windows. But this is also possible.
Thus, the application of this method to the wavelet coefficients at different scales allow to decompose emerging patterns in some meaningful way. I'm not sure whether this is maybe the same what I mentioned now that we can apply some kind of a wavelet transformation and apply a recurrent plot on the decomposed components. Yeah, this is a very useful idea. And there are also some or works already, which go in this direction. Yeah. Then there's a question on prediction, I think. Yeah, um, I'm, I have not done so much in this direction with predicting, but I know that there were some works um, I think in the 90s, trying to use recurrence features for prediction. Yeah. But maybe this is also an idea where we don't we not really need recurrence, but we are just using the phase based trajectory, looking for um, neighbors, and then use this for prediction. This is possible, could be done also with the uh, help of recurrence plots. Um, which RQA measure was accurate enough to detect the given dynamical state? So this is a, um, a bit vague, I think. Maybe to mention here, so you have seen these um, measures. Um, so we have diagonal line structures. Where we have a lot of recurrence measures, we have some vertical structures where we have some measures. Mm, it depends on the research question or on the data you have. If you have, for example, oscillating data without any laminar states, then it's, it would not make sense to apply measures that are based on the vertical line structures, like this laminarity or chopping time you see here on this slide. Then it would make more sense to use um, determinism or this mean line length. But if you have um, data which has laminar states, then it might be even more useful to use these vertical measures. So it's, um, therefore it's a not so general answer. Any further questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, this is Gaurav here. Uh, Professor Sujit had to leave. Uh, so there is one more question in the webinar chat by Dr. Kohler, if you can see it. I see, yeah. Yeah, uh, so the first question is uh, the moving window has a certain length. And we can, of course, choose different lengths. Of course, this has a very strong impact on our analysis. So therefore, the window should be long enough to cover the require time scales that we are interested on. It should not be too long because then we might average out too many different variation. So it should be small enough. So this is then often a trade-off between resolution, temporal resolution or, and um, moving or averaging out the variability. And also it should be long enough to have enough points. Uh, it would not make sense to have this window so small that we have only 10 points. And then we would have never any recurrences maybe. So therefore, this is what I mean. It, uh, it should, long, should be long enough to cover the recurring variability. <clears throat> Yeah, the nonlinear dynamics problems, we have sensitivity on initial conditions, but when we study climate, then we would not have any information about it. And this is true. But this is a problem with paleoclimate data because we have to use what we get. We cannot repeat the experiment like in a, in a lab experiment where we simply can repeat maybe in the, the laser experiment or the combustion experiment. Is something which is really difficult, therefore, we need then some additional tests. 
um, and we are developing in some kind of statistical significance tests and try to answer it in this way. Yeah. The other one is uh, whether we can somehow study the impact on the system behavior due to changing input values. <clears throat> Indeed, we can uh, maybe compare different recurrence behaviors. And this recurrence analysis, we can also study causality. There are some extensions that allow some causal um, inference. And by this, we could then also um, try to answer this question. I would, what of these um, input values like CO2 pollution or CO2 emissions or pollution aerosols, solar forcing is somehow impacting the uh, <clears throat> The global temperature, for example. Let me can show you an example here. And so on the top right, you can see here where this synchronization and coupling is actually what where we did this already. We had then some and uh, this red point in the middle is a global temperature. We have studied the forcing of the global temperature by solar insulation, which is this uh, yellow one, by volcanic eruptions or volcanic aerosols. The greenhouse gas and by uh, some yeah, climate phenomenon, so called El, El Nino Southern Oscillation. And this, all these uh, couplings were based on recurrence analysis. Okay. There's one, one or two more questions. How do you compare measures from recurrence plot and recurrence network and the effectiveness? I think they are not comparable. They are really complementary information coming from these measures. <clears throat> then we look at the recurrence quantifiers we have seen here, and or which are based on the diagonal or vertical line structures. We need the temporal information. Yeah, we are really looking at the temporal evolution of a system and can somehow quantify these, these, these recurrence measures. Then we use recurrence networks and then we have already a phase-based trajectory. And we are just looking at the recurrence structure and the phase space. Then it's more a topological description or the, a geometric description of the shape of the phase-based trajectory, of the geometry of the topology. And not about the dynamics, yeah, because in a network, we actually can shuffle the nodes and um, when we look here at our recurrence or, or time series, it would mean we could shuffle our temporal points. It will change our recurrence quantifiers, which are based on diagonal lines, but it will not change the network measures because these are only um, informations about the recurrences or not. And whether the recurrence comes before or after, this information is lost when we define a com complex network or recurrence network. As information is only in the definition of the uh, phase-based reconstruction, if it is reconstructed, but if, if it is already reconstructed, we can shuffle all time points of the phase-based vectors that will not change the recurrence the network measures. Therefore, it's a bit different, and it's more describing the topology of the system. Is it answer? Ah, yeah. <laughs> OK, is, are there some more questions? I think there are uh, two more questions in QA, and I think nice. we can end the session. So, number of samples drawn for each bootstrap is something fixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an open question, actually. We can use the fixed number or an average number, um, averaged by all these uh, windows, moving windows. Um, this is uh, how it has been so far, but actually this is changing over time. It can change, and therefore it would make sense to uh, go more on to the deep here or to modify this method. Yeah. So the bootstrap approach is, um, I would say, it's the first idea how to do it, but uh, there's a lot of potential to further improve this method. And the last question was, is there any tool for analyzing spatial recurrences? Yeah, there are many, <laughs> many tools for spatial recurrences. The first, we have to distinguish between spatial, uh, static spatial data and changing or dynamic spatial data. And these are two different things. 
and we have just static spatial data, then we usually look for spatial frequencies. If we have a two-dimensional picture and we would like to uh, find the recurrences in all combinations of the space dimensions, in 2D, that this would mean we have two spatial directions, like an X and Y in an Euclidean space. Then the recurrence plot would be four-dimensional one. This is what you can see here on the current slide on the top right one. This is a projection of a four-dimensional recurrence plot to 3D. And then we have a two-dimensional, and then we have two-dimensional data and apply the recurrence approach to these two-dimensional data, we will get a four-dimensional recurrence plot. And then it's not so easy to quantify, but it is possible. And there were works in the, yeah, also almost 20 years ago, yeah, we can do it in this way. But for spatial uh, images that change over time, we are more interested in how the, the images are changing over time and whether we have um, recurring pictures, for example. Um, then we have simply the image. We could consider our image as a phase-based vector and use this, or we can apply um, the so-called mapogram approach, which is a very specific way to somehow transfer the distribution of pixel values, of gray values of a pixel, also to uh, locations. And then we have a new distance measure, which has not only the histograms, compares the histograms, but also the locations of the histograms. And this is a quite powerful tool for spatial temporal recurrences. If you're interested, I can send you some references for this. This is indeed possible, and there's also um, a lot of potential for this method in this field. OK. So you are invited to, to write me if you have questions. I can provide you with some further information or references. Thank you, Dr. Marwan, for the insightful talk and answering the question. Uh, Professor Angipa, if you have any No, no, I don't have any, any more questions. You have answered lots of questions, I can see. So thank you very much. It's a very interesting talk and very nice interactions also. Yeah, you're we welcome. And thanks for the invitation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, everyone, for attending. So the next uh, CTCS seminar will be on October 30th by Professor Hank Dijkstra. Uh, he's a professor of dynamical oceanography at Utrecht University, and he will be talking about uh, dipping of Atlantic Ocean circulation. So we will see you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye, okay, Norbert. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Bye.